tonight on CBC Vancouver News. This morning at approximately 10 a.m., RCMP officers located two male bodies. Manhunt over. Mounties in Manitoba believe they've found the bodies of two B.C. murder suspects. Also on edge in the Okanagan Valley, a fast-moving wildfire quadruples in size. And... We've um, announced the probable death of three uh, southern resident killer whales. Endangered population missing from their pods for weeks. Three orcas are now presumed dead. This is CBC Vancouver News. It's huge to be able to hopefully give some people uh, an opportunity to exhale. The manhunt is over. Investigators believe they have found the bodies of fugitives Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigalski in northern Manitoba, ending a cross-Canada search for the men suspected of killing three people in B.C. RCMP officers found two male bodies this morning and are confident they are the young men from Vancouver Island. But this doesn't mean the investigation into the three murders is over. And it doesn't answer the big question, what triggered this killing spree? The CBC's Leanne Young is live at RCMP headquarters in Surrey tonight with more on what Mounties here and in Manitoba are saying. Leanne? Well, Mike, the big question is, why did these two actually kill, allegedly kill three people? And we may never know now as their bodies were found. Just hours ago, Assistant Commissioner Kevin Hackett here at the BCRCMP says that we may never definitively be able to ascertain what Briar Schmigelski and Cam McLeod's motives were, even though there is significant evidence that links them to the deaths of Lucas Fowler, China Deese, and Leonard Dick. And at this point, um, uh, RCMP are also saying that... Um, just because the search has come to a close, it doesn't mean that the investigation is over. In a search that spanned four provinces over three weeks, and finally the words, they've been found. This morning, at approximately 10 a.m., RCMP officers located two male bodies. The bodies believed to be of triple murder suspects, Briar Schmigelski and Cam McLeod. It's huge to be able to hopefully give some people uh, an opportunity to exhale and to hopefully eventually go back to normal and not being afraid of who's out in the woods anymore. The 18 and 19 year olds suspected of killing three people, UBC lecturer Leonard Dick, Australian tourist Lucas Fowler and his American girlfriend China Deese. It's a love story that's ended tragically. It really is. It's the worst ever love story. Their bodies left off the side of highways in northern BC. Today, Deese's mother only responded by saying she was speechless. The manhunt ended in northern Manitoba. For the last two and a half weeks, RCMP officers fought their way through thick, dense brush by land and air, hunting for any trace of the pair. Then, a damaged boat and a breakthrough. Items directly linked to the suspects were located on the shoreline of the Nelson River. Following this discovery, we were at last able to narrow down the search. Manitoba RCMP wouldn't give any details into the state of Schmigelski and McLeod when they were found, or how they managed to survive in the difficult terrain. But BC RCMP are looking to that trail of evidence for answers. We still need to ensure that our investigative findings, whether it's statements, evidentiary timelines, physical or digital evidence, continues to confirm our investigative theory and eliminates any other possibilities or suspects. Until that is completed, we will not conclude this file. In the small town of Port Alberni, where the teens quickly made news, becoming the country's most wanted fugitives, residents were shaken. I think a lot of people are relieved that this matter is over. There are people in Port Alberni who know the families of these two boys, and of course, uh, they're very saddened by the news. I have three sons. Um, I feel deeply um, for their families and what they're going through. Um, I don't think anybody is going to have any calm or I don't think that this is um, just, okay, it's over now, let's just move on. I think that there's going to be a lot of stuff to process. Outside the home of Schmigelski's family, a sign asking for privacy as a family and a community comes to grips with a tragic outcome for everyone involved. 
And just about an hour ago, we heard from the mayor of Port Alberni, Shari Minions, express her thanks to the armed forces and the BC RCMP and say that while the community is relieved that investigation has now, now that the search is over, it doesn't mean that uh, everything has come to a close. It's still been a very difficult time for the community, and she is encouraging everyone who needs support and to go and seek out those resources in the community, and they are committed to helping RCMP do whatever they need to be needs to be done to find the answers that they need in this investigation. Mike? All right, CBC's Leanne Young reporting live tonight in Surrey. Thanks. Now, today's developments come more than three weeks after the bodies of Lucas Fowler, China Deese, and later Leonard Dick were discovered in northern BC. Our Megan Batchelor looks at who the victims were and the impact their killings have had on the people who love them. I need for anyone with information to share that because this can't happen to another family. And I mean, it shouldn't have happened to ours. A grief-stricken mother in the southern U.S., eight days after her daughter's body was found on a lonely highway in B.C.'s far north. China Deese was 24, traveling with her Australian boyfriend, 23-year-old Lucas Fowler. This is the last known video of the couple together before they were killed by gunshots. We are just distraught. This has really torn two families apart. Stephen Fowler, a senior officer on the New South Wales Police Force, traveled to Canada. Lucas was was just a, a fun-loving guy who, you know, had a goal to travel the world. He met China and uh, they became an inseparable pair. You know, it's a, it's a love story that's ended tragically. It really is. Sheila Deese said her family was in despair. I have one last child, and I have three very sad children. They always say, you know, mom can only be as happy as her saddest child, and I have three broken kids. The body of the third victim was discovered on July 19th, well west of the first crime scene, near a Dodge pickup truck with a camper that was on fire. It took five days to identify Leonard Dick, age 64, a botanist who lectured at the University of British Columbia. The hard work he did raising his kids um, and the equally hard work he did as a researcher, he loved it. His family said, quote, he was a loving husband and father. His death has created unthinkable grief and we're struggling to understand what has happened. Friends say he enjoyed camping and was passionate about plant life. That may be what led him to his final hours amid the BC wilderness. Megan Batchelor, CBC News, Vancouver. And we will have more to come on this story later in tonight's newscast. Our Tanya Fletcher is live in Port Alberni tonight with more reaction and more on the murder suspects. And our Angela Johnston will have more on where the bodies were found in Manitoba. A geologist from Vancouver has been killed in a plane crash in the Yukon. Yukon Coroner Service say the passenger was 33-year-old Julia Lane. The pilot, 24-year-old Sean Thomas Kitchen, also died. The Alcan air-operated plane was reported missing Tuesday afternoon after leaving a mining airstrip en route to Mayo. The Transportation Safety Board is investigating. More concern tonight for BC's southern resident killer whales. Scientists have declared three members of the endangered animals dead. But as our Dan Burrett reports, their loss may not be all that surprising. A matriarch, a young male, and an even younger male. This trio of orcas hasn't been seen off the coast of BC since last winter. Now scientists believe they won't appear again. We've announced the uh, probable death of three uh, southern resident killer whales, um, L-84, K-25, and J-17. That drops their numbers down to 73. Researchers say J-17 and K-25 were in poor health already before they vanished. This time of year, the whale pods are usually located around the southern end of Vancouver Island and in the waters off the U.S. San Juan Islands. But there's been no sign of the three with their families since early July. J-17 was 42 years old, a leader of her pod. These guys are a matriarchal society. They're, um, you know, very much... Um, need that dominant female to be leading the group 
and to, to lose that animal means that um, they lose some culture, some knowledge. J-17 was also the mother of a female orca who was spotted carrying her dead calf for more than two weeks last year. The whales are listed as a species at risk in Canada. They've struggled to find enough of their preferred food, Chinook salmon. So what now? I would say it's not time to panic. Um, three deaths in a year is, is certainly on the high end, but it's not unprecedented. Um, I, I, I think it's one of a series of continued signs that this population isn't doing well. A population struggling to find enough to eat, threatening the survival of an iconic animal here on the West Coast. Dan Burrett, CBC News, Vancouver. An out of control wildfire in the South Okanagan has quadrupled in size in just the last two days. The Eagle Bluff fire has grown to nine square kilometers, putting more than 200 properties at risk. And as Brady Strachan reports tonight, it's now threatening a high security prison. Behind me, the thick gray smoke from the Eagle Bluff wildfire is billowing up into the sky here north of Oliver. The hot, dry weather and winds in the South Okanagan has pushed this fire up and down this slope and filled the valley with smoke. A nuisance for some, but a real danger for others who live in the nearby community of Gallagher Lake. Boy, I tell you, this really scares me. This really scares me. The fire is burning just on the other side of a small lake from Karen Greaves' home. She and dozens of her neighbours are on evacuation alert, ready to leave at a moment's notice. So if it comes across, well, we are all between trees here. It will go. And these trees are tinder dry, the grass, everything is... We haven't had rain for a long, long time, so everything is too dry. So it makes it really, really tough. More than just homes are at risk. The fire is burning near the South Okanagan Correctional Center, a maximum security jail that houses close to 300 inmates. It's on evacuation alert, and authorities are making plans to move inmates to other jails in Kamloops and the Lower Mainland. The jail guards union says 100 high-risk inmates have already been transferred, but another 200 remain. Not far away, the firefight is on. Helicopters are hauling buckets of water to drop on the blaze one after another. And the BC Wildfire Service is fighting the fire with fire by using a controlled burn. So the crews all use drip torches to do some hand ignitions from that containment line all the way up to the fire perimeter and it just removes the combustible fuel between the fire perimeter and that control line there so that it prevents the fire from coming further down into the valley and it brings the fire to us on our own terms. She says that will push even more smoke into the sky in the region. It's little comfort to Karen Grieve, who can only watch and wait. I don't know. You know, it's scary. It's very scary, especially when you're an older person and you're by yourself. What are you going to do? Despite the fire and the thick smoke, the BC Wildfire Service says the region's tourism operators are still open for business, and it's encouraging anyone who has booked a holiday here to still come and enjoy the region. Brady Strachan, CBC News, near Oliver. Meantime, fire crews on the Sunshine Coast are getting the upper hand on a much smaller wildfire. It's burning north of Pender Harbor. That fire broke out Monday near Sackanaw Lake, and it's less than a square kilometer in size. The six initial attack members and 17 unit crew members now have a line around the entire perimeter of that fire. Cause of the blaze not yet determined. So some good news on that front, but the BC Wildfire Service isn't as pleased with campers in our province. It says fire wardens had to extinguish 32 abandoned campfires over the BC day long weekend and they're urging the public to be more careful with campfires to help reduce the risk of wildfires. 92 of the 118 fires the service has responded to in the Kamloops Fire Center this year are suspected to be caused by people. And Brett Soderholm is here now with a closer look at the fire danger rating uh, around our province tonight. Brett? 
Yeah, it really is, unfortunately, at this point in time, pretty well the worst that it can be in the area where we are currently seeing some of these fires, specifically into the South Okanagan. We are at our extreme level. This is about as high as it gets. But of course, in other areas, especially, say, in South Vancouver Island and even in the Sunshine Coast, it is very high to extreme at this point in time. And unfortunately, relief is not really going to be anywhere in sight until the weekend. The theme really has been about all of this smoke really into the South Okanagan region, and there still is this special air quality statement in effect from Environment Canada that is not budging as long as the weather pattern stays the same. And about this weather pattern, I'm not sure if you've seen this yet, but the daytime high temperatures that we've received already across the South Okanagan, we're looking at anywhere between 37 in Soyuz, 36 in Penticton, but Warfield, just outside of Castlegar, 39 degrees was the high that they got up to today. So to say that it was hot would be a little bit of an understatement. We have a heat warning still in effect for Lillooet and Lytton, and then closer to, in general, the south coast uh, really is sort of the southern half of BC that is we still have a special weather statement in place for hot temperatures that are going to be continuing right through tomorrow where they could be getting up to 30 degrees and lastly as if that wasn't enough to be dealing with we still have severe thunderstorm watches in place for the peace region including also Prince George and there is a lot of lightning activity which of course does not bode well for the fire situation okay Brett thanks for that we'll talk to you again in a bit and we have more details tonight on that loud explosion on a freighter under the Lionsgate Bridge last night that startled onlookers yesterday evening. Wow. Yeah, many saw this large white plume of smoke yesterday following a loud bang. It happened just before 5 o'clock. A fumigation hatch blew open on the bulk carrier Minnow and Glory. 22 crew members and a pilot were on board, but no reported injuries. Transport Canada says the vessel won't be allowed to depart until the federal agency reviews its seaworthiness. RCMP and the Vancouver Port Authority are also investigating. Well, the beloved White Rock Pier is set to reopen before the end of summer after powerful winds cut the pier in half. A massive windstorm, you'll recall, swept through White Rock last December. It damaged the pier, waterfront, and boats on the marina. The city of White Rock says the new section will be more resilient due to steel pilings, a concrete deck, and timber planks. The pier is scheduled to reopen August 31st during the Labor Day long weekend. Vancouver is one step closer to solving its affordable housing crisis, at least in the minds of some. Funding has been secured for 1,100 new units in nine development projects around the city. The federal government has pledged up to $184 million for construction of affordable housing on city-owned sites. The first project to receive the cash is a 140-unit cooperative housing development already under construction in the River District in South Vancouver. Eight other projects are already lined up, ranging from co-op housing, mixed-market rentals, and temporary modular housing. Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart says today's announcement should help get people off the street. We all feel that there's something very, very wrong uh, in the downtown east side, especially in Oppenheimer Park. Uh, and it, it'll take all three levels of government working together in partnership to, uh, to alleviate it. But the announcement today will have a direct impact on that. Stewart says the temporary modular housing site could open as early as February. And just a reminder, you can watch this newscast and all of CBC's other award-winning content wherever you go by downloading the free CBC Gem app. The app does only work in Canada, however. So if you can find CBC Vancouver on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, you can follow us on all those platforms for extra content you will not see here on TV. Well, they're getting surprise phone calls, even visits from Canada's spy agency. Coming up, what is CSIS trying to find out from Canadian university students? They're the most studied and famous whale family in the world. What's pushing J-Pod to the brink? I'm Gloria Makarenko, host of the new CBC British Columbia original podcast, Killers. Is it too late to save them? Of course, here on the West Coast, there is a lot of concern over the whales. But on Prince Edward Island, they have a similar problem, only over there, it's bats that are at risk of disappearing. CBC's Stephanie Van Campen followed a group of biologists who are spending these hot summer nights on bat patrol. If I aim it over there, the signal's a little bit weaker. 
That beep is a radio signal coming from a thumbnail-sized transmitter that Evan Walt Baltzer glued to the back of a bat two weeks ago. The bat, Katrina, named after his wife, is spending her days sleeping somewhere in this house, likely the roof. What we're trying to do is understand what makes these places special. Um, are there any uniting characteristics among roosts um, that we can look for because if we understand where bats are going and what's special then you know maybe we can do a better job of protecting those spaces. The bats are now at risk due to a fungal disease called white nose syndrome that began wiping them out in North America more than 10 years ago. In PEI, Baltzer says about 40 percent of the bats he's found have scarring from the disease. The most heartbreaking things is finding scars um, all over the wings and ears of these bats and so some of them will have you know just a, a white patch here here or there, these old scars, um, but others have scars like right across both wings and, and some of them even have holes in their wings. Baltzer is spending his nights trapping bats with giant nets in the national park, tagging them with a tiny transmitter and tracking where they roost. It's really good to see everybody coming together to provide the expertise and the information that we need to monitor these species at risk, where, finding out where their critical habitat is and then we can work together to protect them. Researchers will continue trapping and tracking bats in the PEI National Park next summer and file a report with their findings in 2021. Stephanie Van Campen, CBC News, Cavendish. And halfway around the world, a Dutch company is paying fishermen in India to help clean up the ocean in a novel attempt to create green jobs while boosting water sports. The company pays fishermen to collect abandoned fishing gear. The nets are a major cause of ocean pollution. They kill marine life and damage fishing boats. The plastic is recycled into eco-friendly surfboards. The company says the project helps the community, the environment, and of course water sports. It's estimated eight million tons of plastic is dumped into the ocean every year. Well, we'll be back in just a second with the latest headlines from right across the country. Stay with us. Some Canadian university students have been getting surprise phone calls or even visits from CSIS, Canada's spy agency. And it's happening more often than you might expect, to the point that Canada's largest university is launching a new hotline to provide information and help students when Canadian intelligence agents come calling. In the CBC exclusive story, Shanifa Nasser hears firsthand about one student's experience. Ramzaziz wasn't sure he wanted to go on camera for this story. For years, the University of Toronto law graduate has kept quiet about his experience with CSIS. You don't know who to share with. Like, you know, like, what if my law school finds out? What would they do? He says few students are willing to go public about being contacted by the spy agency because of the stigma. I think the reason why this has gone on too long is because of this faceless terrorist threat. We're just regular people. Aziz was first contacted by a CSIS agent in 2012 when he was a student at Dalhousie University. He agreed to meet, but says it was never clear what the agent was looking for. A few years later in Toronto, a pair of officers showed up at his in-law's door asking about him. You feel like the government's national security apparatus is on you, right? And so, and you feel like a criminal, right? Even though you haven't done anything wrong. When it's university students subject to this kind of um, surveillance or investigation, it's concerning to me as an educator. Here at the University of Toronto, the Institute of Islamic Studies has started a hotline. Students can call it for free legal advice and information on their rights and obligations if CSIS contacts them. The vast majority of these students are Muslim. Criminal lawyer Nader Hassan is one of the project's co-chairs. He's seen 10 such cases in the last 18 months. It's not really clear uh, what got them on CSIS's radar in many instances. They can't charge you with a criminal offense. CSIS can do all kinds of things to make your life more difficult. 
Um, and so people need to know that. In a statement to CBC News, CISA says it builds relationships with individuals to collect information and advise our government about threats to national security, and that it respects the confidentiality, discretion and the privacy rights of those with whom we interact. As for Aziz, he says he wishes a hotline had been available when CSIS contacted him. Because I would definitely use it, just to know what, what to do. Um, because I don't want to undermine the government's activities. I don't know what the, but the thing is, I don't know what their objectives are. Shanifa Nasser, CBC News, Toronto. First Nations groups that favor the construction of pipelines have a new source of funding for court battles. It's the United Conservative Party's Alberta government. For too long, uh, pro-development First Nations have been ignored. That is why today, Alberta's government is launching a $10 million litigation fund to support legal efforts uh, by First Nations who want to be partners in prosperity through responsible resource development. Kenny calls it part of his government's effort at reconciliation combined with his agenda to increase economic growth and jobs. The fund can be accessed by First Nations or even groups that simply include Indigenous people. And they don't have to be from Alberta. Kenny says a group of First Nations entrepreneurs in B.C. who supported the Northern Gateway Pipeline proposal can also apply. That project was shelved after new regulations were introduced about increased tanker traffic and in part due to Indigenous opposition to the plan. Meanwhile, Canada's Green Party unveiled a new plan today to support workers in the fossil fuel industry during a transition to renewable energy economy. Green Party leader Elizabeth May revealed the party's plans in Vancouver this morning. She says it's time to help workers transition to a sustainable industry. We've built in the time required to be prepared to protect workers and assure them and their families and communities that they won't be left behind. The Green Party's plans include a number of strategies, including investing in apprenticeship programs. India's decision yesterday to remove the special legal status it had accorded the Kashmir region has sparked political retaliation from Pakistan. Fill for hum downgrade kar rahe hai our diplomatic relations with India. Today, Pakistan downgraded diplomatic relations with its neighbor and announced a trade suspension. It is the latest sign of ongoing tension between the two countries, which both lay claim to the territory. And it comes after India opted to place its portion of Kashmir under Indian law rather than allowing the local Muslim majority to make its own laws. India says Kashmir's special status hinders the region's development and its integration with the rest of the country. Pakistan and India have twice gone to war over the territory. Now, the march today is for two main reasons. The first is to have an independent inquiry uh, into the causes of these events. Hundreds of lawyers took to the streets of Hong Kong today demanding an independent legal system. The calls come after police arrested hundreds of people during ongoing protests. Demonstrators accuse Hong Kong authorities of putting China's interests above respect for the law. Well, the past couple of months, there have been massive rallies as residents opposed a proposed extradition bill allowing people to be sent to mainland China for trial. More than a dozen people have been killed, nearly 150 wounded in a suicide car bomb attack outside a police station in the Afghan capital. Most of the victims were women, children and other civilians. The Taliban is claiming responsibility for the attack. It came in the midst of talks between the Taliban and the United States that would see American troops withdraw from Afghanistan. In exchange, the militant group is pledging to cut ties with other extremists and not use Afghanistan as a base to plot further attacks. Well, the manhunt is over. The bodies of two men believed to be the B.C. murder suspects found by police in Manitoba. Coming up, more about the young fugitives from Vancouver Island.
Our top story tonight on CBC Vancouver News. At this time, we believe these are the bodies of the two suspects wanted in connection with the homicides in British Columbia. Police in Manitoba now believe they have found the bodies of BC fugitives Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski. The bodies were discovered by Mounties this morning in dense brush about a kilometer from where items linked to the pair were found along the Nelson River. Now the area where the two were found is in uh, just northeast of Gillam, Manitoba, and that's where much of the RCMB search has been concentrated for more than two weeks now. Angela Johnston has more. We knew that we needed just to find that one piece of evidence that could move this search forward. On Friday, August 2nd, that one critical piece of evidence was found. That evidence, only what police will describe as personal items linked to Briar Schmigelski and Cam McLeod, found near this boat. Their discovery was the beginning of the end of this search. Police now knew where to look. This morning, at approximately 10 a.m., our CMP officers located two male bodies. Police say they're confident the bodies are those of the suspects, but autopsies have been ordered to be sure and to shed light on how they died and when. Police say the bodies were found in dense brush, about eight kilometers northeast of where the SUV Schmigelski McLeod drove here was found on fire more than two weeks ago. Today, BC RCMP confirmed it belonged to Leonard Dick, the last of the three people the pair is accused of killing. Here in Gillam, nagging fear and that heavy police presence had become the norm. So today, word that it's all finally over was met with relief. Well, just an absolute sense of relief that there's going to be some closure for, for the communities. But with it, an understanding of what the deaths of the wanted men, if confirmed, could mean for the families of Dick, Lucas Fowler and China Deese. All three were found murdered in B.C. in July. Their loved ones have been waiting for answers ever since. Those families, uh, I don't know how they're ever going to get closure from this because uh, I don't know how they can get answers and uh, I feel deeply for those families. China Deese's mother reacted with one word, speechless, she told us. Police were asked today how the suspects were able to elude them for so long. RCMP defended their investigation, pointing out just how much of Canada it covered. Well, I, I don't think I need to educate anyone on the geography of this country, but it's a huge country. If you look at the distance traveled, this is like, and I looked at it on a map, this is like traveling from London to Moscow. To the RCMP officers who carried out this search, thanks today from the top. I commend you for your determination, your innovation, for never giving up. Angela Johnston, CBC News, Gillam, Manitoba. People in Manitoba may be breathing a little easier tonight, but for the suspects' families back here in B.C., today's news brings little comfort as they struggle to come to terms with it all. Tanya Fletcher reports tonight from Port Alberni. For two young men whose photos have been seen around the world, the community where they're from is stunned to hear these latest developments. It's a mixed reaction, you know, but I'm glad if it is the boys, I'm glad that, you know, Canada's safe now. We don't have to search anymore. Friends since childhood, the two had just finished a summer job at Walmart before leaving town last month, saying they were looking for work in Whitehorse. How they went from a road trip to missing persons to murder suspects to fugitives is still unknown and for the family, deeply unsettling. At first we thought that he was missing and, you know, we we're all worried about it. And, uh, and then it was really shocking to hear that they, you know, these are suspects, so they've charged them. You know, and uh, it just, uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't fit, uh, you know. I've never heard of just two good kids going out and doing something like this. Lee McNabb's aunt is Briar Schmigelski's grandmother, whom he lived with for many years. She's a nice lady and she loves that kid. He says this latest news doesn't make sense to the family. They're being charged, they're not guilty, like let's see some proof. Uh, let's see what the RCMP have like there's there's got to be some some holes in this story and RCMP acknowledge some of those answers may never come it's going to be extremely difficult for us to um, ascertain uh, definitively what the motive was obviously we will not have the opportunity to speak with these individuals and the CBC's Tanya Fletcher is live in Port Alberni tonight. Tanya, we, we seem to know more about Schmigelski than McLeod. I know you've been trying to find out more about him. Uh, what have you learned? 
Yeah, Mick, we really don't know as much about Cam McLeod, but people I've been speaking with here in Port Alberni over the past a few weeks uh, say the 19-year-old was a polite young man. Uh, workers at the coffee shop he frequented uh, describe him as uh, considerate, and those are the same words his father used to describe him. Now, Keith McLeod still hasn't spoken with the media, but about 10 days ago, I spoke with him on the phone. Uh, at the time, he said he was uh, couldn't get through a sentence without breaking down, and uh, he did describe his son as kind, caring, and considerate, always concerned about other people's feelings. He still hasn't spoken, and uh, I imagine he's still feeling the same things tonight, just unable to cope and still trying to get some answers, as are many here in Port Alberni. Mike? All right, Tanya Fletcher, live with Reaction in Port Alberni tonight. Thanks. A well, live look at uh, downtown Vancouver. Science World there at 638 on this warm Wednesday evening and another warm and sunny day on the south coast. Is there more to come? Brett's forecast is next. Brett is back. Uh, you mentioned you were using Fahrenheit talking about the temperature in your apartment. <laughs> I last. do, so, I did. You know, I do too because yeah. for some reason we've just left ours on, on Fahrenheit. Right. It's like 82. Yeah, that's not comfortable no, really, not to be, and especially for sleeping. At I 10 o'clock at night, right? Yeah, no, nowhere that's going to be the case. But there is some good news. I mean, we're not investing in air conditioners anytime soon, no. but I think Mother Nature will take care of this for us as we get into the weekend. So I'll give you more on that in a little bit, but I wanted to first of all show you how the day started off here. Again, no real surprise. It was a pretty beautiful start to the morning that sun came up as it loves to do and there weren't a lot of clouds there to block its view from us so there wasn't a lot to report on here but it definitely did heat up and uh, I think this has just kind of become the norm I mean I don't know if you're getting bored of it I personally enjoy a nice sunny morning as much as the average person wanted to show you the water temperatures are like right now just across the lower mainland widespread really we're looking at around 24 degrees a bit warmer over onto Vancouver Island though cooler actually down at Victoria Airport only 18 degrees and then into uh, the phrase Valley we're looking at upwards of the upper 20s. In terms of what we can be expecting over the next 24 hours I wanted to show you how our lows are going to be going down again right around 16 degrees for the most part a little cooler toward Richmond, Burnaby and New West but the one thing you're going to notice about tomorrow's forecast for temperatures it's going to be cooler and not just right downtown for Vancouver but widespread all across the region it's going to be tough to get above 25 degrees and this is because we're starting to go through a little bit of a pattern change here that means rain yes a blessed rain that we need 
speed is going to be coming in the forecast. So I want to show you where. This is going to be making a trajectory up across Washington State throughout Friday. And by the time that we get into the pre-dawn hours of Saturday, we're going to be looking at some fairly widespread and honestly much needed rain coming all across the south coast, including for the Okanagan, which should certainly help the fire situation there. And even better, at this point in time, it's not looking to be ruining your entire Saturday. So if you still want to get out there and enjoy it, there should be plenty of time to do so. But it is going to be sticking around for the weekend, and I'll show you that in a second. Thursday and into Friday, still just a mix of sun and clouds. Temperatures will be right around 23 or 24 degrees. But Saturday and Sunday, those are the days, unfortunately, our precious weekend days, as we know, looking a little bit more unsettled right now. So temperatures on the cooler side, but again, try to keep in mind, seasonal for Vancouver right now is right around 22, so that's not actually too chilly. And it's not going to be a whole lot of rain, but probably just enough to do some uh, natural watering for us. I yeah, think. well, we could use a bit of precip. I so. think we definitely could. There you go. Too bad it's on the weekend. But I know. Yeah. Can't always win, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as Canada continues to savor the Toronto Raptors NBA championship, there's another basketball team that's about to hit the hardwood. Yes, the Canadian men's national team begins its journey tonight to qualify for the Olympics. Our Devin Haru has more. Somewhat of a calm before tonight's basketball storm here in Toronto as a Canadian national men's team looks to qualify for the Olympics for the first time in nearly two decades. They just wrapped up their third practice. The quest starts now and at the center of it is head coach Nick Nurse, of course, head coach of the Raptors, leading the team to an historic first title, now hoping to put Canada back on the basketball map. He's wanting to make his mark on this team. I had a conversation with him just a short time ago. He says he wants full buy-in from the 19 players here on the roster, and so far, so good. I give him 10 out of 10 on buy-in. I mean, the guys that are here are, are in with both feet and, and with a pure heart, and um, it's, it's been great. Many have called this the golden era in Canadian basketball, and there has been conversations about why some of the superstars aren't here. Nick Nurse doesn't care about that. He's concerned about the 19 players who are here. He knows they're going to have to play some of the best basketball of their lives for Canada to qualify. They'll play seven exhibition games beginning tonight against Nigeria at the Manabe Center in downtown Toronto. Then they'll go to Winnipeg, then they play a number of games, all leading to the World Cup in China at the beginning of September. September 1st is the first game against Australia. Canada will have to place in the top two in the Americas region. Then they'll punch a ticket to the Olympics. Nick Nurse says it can happen, and he's at the helm now of this national program. Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. Donald Trump greeted by protesters in Texas and Ohio as he visits the sites of two mass shootings. Coming up, their message for the U.S. president.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC Vancouver is a proud sponsor of the Vancouver Queer Film Festival. The festival showcases dynamic and thought-provoking films and provides a vibrant space for queer arts, culture, and community. And your favorite summer tradition is back. Musical Nooners is back for its 10th year, so grab a lunch and a friend and enjoy free concerts weekdays at noon all summer long. For more, check us out online. He is being accused of stoking anti-immigrant tension and creating a culture of violence. And U.S. President Donald Trump was once again greeted by protesters as he arrived in Texas tonight. Trump was in El Paso and earlier in Ohio to visit two mass shooting sites where more than 30 people were killed last weekend. The CBC's Kim Brunhuber is in Texas tonight. The drums in El Paso started beating before the president even landed, the anger as palpable as the midday heat. The message to Donald Trump in English and Spanish, stay away, you have blood on your hands. I think he's a racist and incite these kinds of events. Do you believe President Trump is to blame for the shooting? I do believe he is. Erica Lopez and her friends say Trump's visit just opens raw wounds. We're pissed, we're upset. For him to come here, it's, it's a mistake. He shouldn't be here today. Most in this crowd don't care what brought him here, be it compassion or politics. Minds are firmly closed. There's nothing he could say that could... No. For Monica Berthold, carrying the most DIY of signs, it's the distinction between prompter Trump and rally Trump. When he speaks from the heart, he, he speaks hatred. So, so no, no. No one can trust what he says. USA! 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 Not far away, a much smaller crowd rolling out a big welcome for the president. I think his presence here will show that he is the president of all the people and that he came here uh, to bring uh, empathy to the people who were, the families of the people who were murdered here by this lunatic. USA! They firmly reject the idea that Trump is to blame for this or any of the racially motivated shootings in America. You know, there's been a lot of divisiveness, but it's been caused by the people that have been fighting Donald Trump for the last two and a half years. And if anybody, I think it's them that actually have the blood on their hands. It's the Democrats, you mean? Democrats. Soon, the Trump supporters were joined by a few anti-Trump demonstrators. Nobody ever touched you, so what the heck are you lying about that for, huh? Who were then themselves protested. Go back to your rallies, you don't like it here. USA. And on it goes. While not 200 meters away, the gunshot victims lie in hospital, fighting for their lives. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, El Paso, Texas. And after three mass shootings in just two weeks, it's clear people across the U.S. are on edge. What the f is going on? This video was shot last night in Times Square in New York. People running in panic after someone thought they heard gunshots. Turns out it was just a motorcycle backfiring. A few people suffered minor injuries in the unnecessary rush to flee the area. It's a tool for doctors searching for cancer in their patients, but a medical dye used with MRI scans comes with risks of its own. As Rafi Bujakanian reports, it saved one woman from a brain tumor, but has since led to other complications. My skin is burning, it's like it's on fire. Wanda Millie rarely leaves the house anymore. For four years, she's lived with these marks. It's spongy. It doesn't like the sun when it can't direct sunlight and even just heat. The marks appeared after Millie received seven MRI scans between 2012 and 2015, part of medical care for her brain tumor. She was injected with gadolinium for the scans. The metallic dye creates sharp contrasts in imaging, improving detection. I just wish there was more information on like for for me and others. She's dying right in front of me here. Hollywood celebrity Chuck Norris and his wife Gina O'Kelly are suing drug manufacturers. O'Kelly says she suffered debilitating side effects from her MRI scans, which also used gadolinium. It's like somebody's poured acid on your tissues. 
The U.S. Food and Drug Administration requires medical professionals to warn patients the dye may not leave their bodies. In a statement, Health Canada advises use gadolinium-based contrast agents only when necessary, use the lowest effective dose and assess any potential risks before repeated doses. What we need is larger patient data. This radiologist acknowledges that nearly 1,500 adverse event reports are linked to gadolinium, but he says that's a small number considering the millions of Canadians getting injections every year. What I would encourage them to do is to discuss the symptoms in depth with their physician. Wanda Millie's already done that, but she says nobody's helped while she continues to isolate herself, even from her daughter. It, it broke my heart that I realized I've allowed this to stay stop me from living, from doing things. Millie wants others to hear her story and consider the risks. Rafi Bujikan, UNCBC News, Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. Coming up, why everything's not exactly ducky in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Thursday on the early edition, we'll hear from the federal minister responsible for CMHC as the federal government announces the construction of 1,100 new housing units in Metro Vancouver. That and more tomorrow on the early edition. Okay, it's a situation that has some Nova Scotia residents all a flutter. And it's keeping firefighters busy. Yeah, you can believe it. What has people raising the alarm, you may ask? Yeah, ducklings. Go figure. CBC's Emma Davey has the details. We're referring to it here in the, in the department as Duckgate. Station 13 has had five calls this year about ducklings trapped in a fish gate in Sullivan's Pond. Firefighters are here. Firefighters have made their way to the pond to try and help the ducklings get out of the ladder. 
ducklings in the river can't be Dartmouth's cat up a tree call for the fire department all the time. The city councilor says Halifax Water is looking at the design to see if it can become more duck friendly. Through practice, you, you discover your design flaws, and one of the pieces that uh, in the fish ladder that no one thought about fully was uh, what would happen to ducklings when they get on the other side because the lip is too high for them to hop back up, and the current coming through the uh, fish ladder piece, it's perfect for fish, but it's too strong for ducklings. Oh, don't go over the next one, no! But while onlookers are calling with concerns about the ducklings, it's the people the city and the fire department are worried about. We witnessed the ducks going down over the slide. I think it's almost like a fun park for them and they come running right back up. So we're, we respond because we're concerned residents will try to rescue the ducks and maybe hurt themselves in the water in the process. We all love the ducklings, but do not go into the river yourself. The fire department is the appropriate ones to call. The fire department says they've been in touch with Hope for Wildlife to try and work out a solution because it can't be left up to the firefighters. Any time that you take a firefighter and occupy him with a, a a non-essential duty, you run the risk that uh, the firefighter won't be available to respond to someone when they do need them for a life safety type of event. But the department has been taking the calls like water off a duck's back. Emma Davey, CBC News, Dartmouth. Uh, you knew that line was coming. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I honestly am a little bit more worried for that guy that was standing there trying to rescue them. I mean, ducks float. They like to go yes. over it. They said it was like a little water park. It actually looked kind of fun, but yeah. I feel the person that was there, they had taken a tumble by contrast. Probably not you nearly as fun. Slap them with a hefty fine if they yeah. try to go in. Exactly. I mean, it's an important message. Make sure you're using the fire re resources appropriately. Exactly. But uh, Dartmouth's little yes. cat up the tree <laughs> problem Very involving true. ducks. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's it for us tonight. Uh, you can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. Next local news right here 11 o'clock with Mr. Dan Burrett after the National. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. night.